One of my favorite things to do on this Mostly Pokemon channel is make a video that basically isn't about a Pokemon and make it about a Pokemon. Basically, teaching a lesson of sorts, be it science, history, some third thing. But then I use a Pokemon to make it more fun and interesting. And today's video is basically that towards the end. We're going to go over the origins of Silicobra and Sandaconda, and then at the end get into some more serious stuff about them. A thing that may or may not be a part of Sandaconda's origins, most likely not, but either way, it's an educational lesson. But I am prefacing this video with this more serious tone because it does get quite a bit serious towards the end. So, if you are sensitive or just not in the mood for topics surrounding supposed animal cruelty and euthanasia, then the latter part of this video isn't for you, but I will make it very clear before we get into that. So, the first part of this video is just the fun, usual stuff that you're used to, where we're just digging into some origins. Fun stuff. Let's get into it. Ugh, there's no beating around the bush. I've got to say it now to get it out of the way. Yes, Silicobra looks like an uncircumcised wee-wee. You happy now? I guess that means there is beating around the bush. Wow, chicka wow wow. Silicobra is a silly cobra, hence the name. But actually it's from silicon, a common element in sand. It's a desert cobra, of which there are many. But instead of just a cobra hood, it has a sand bag. Then, Sandaconda is an anaconda, a large, large snake with sand as well. You see the weird, like, donut thing? It's got sand in that. And it shoots that sand out of its nose, like a shotgun. Notably, the double-barreled shotgun was invented by Joseph Manton, an Englishman in the 1830s. Like basically every Gen 8 Pokemon, is British in origin. Oh my word. Now, you're not going to believe this. I didn't believe it either. The British also invented sandbags. Uh, now, I know, how do you invent a bag with sand in it? Surely some Arabian got sand in their bag at some point, and that's true. But were they the first to put sand in a bag on purpose? to specifically make a sandbag for use in having a lot of sand in a lot of bags? Well, maybe they did. But did they write down that they did that? No, they didn't. The first recorded use of a sandbag was in the 18th century when they were made to form makeshift walls during the American Revolutionary War by British loyalists. So yeah, while cobras and anacondas are not British by any means, the two secondary elements that are added onto these Pokémon are... God, I love Pokémon! So, these two Pokémon eat sand, but they don't ingest it dietarily. Rather, they store it in their sandbags to then spit back out as an attack. In the case of Sandaconda, like a shotgun. But in the case of Silicobra, it spits it out... like a cobra. Ain't that nifty. Most venomous snakes bite onto their prey or attacker to inject them with venom via their needle-like things. But various species of cobra are unique in that they can actually leak their venom on you. I, I couldn't... I'm really bad at doing it on command, but I swear it happens accidentally all the time. stock footage of Gleegan, so just in case you didn't know what that was. This venom that they spit is basically harmless on your skin, and it only really causes mild blistering if it's left unwashed for too long. But if it gets in your eyes, you've got yourself some temporary blindness. Leave it in too long, and you're looking at permanent vision damage, if not total blindness. So I guess you're not looking at it then. But, um, now, there are a few different species of anaconda, but the green anaconda is the one people usually think of. It's the largest snake ever. One anaconda was recorded at, granted it was an outlier, but it was 29 feet long and 550 pounds! Oh no! Though, it's a jungle dwelling snake. Sanaconda is a desert snake, and it, it, the pattern on it seems to resemble a diamondback rattlesnake, or maybe a desert sidewander. I mean, the sidewinders, they kind of... 
bend a lot to move, like Sanaconda. Though they don't have the right tail or head. I mean, if you ignore the shotgun snout, uh, its face seems to be more desert python-y? Maybe? And those have the right colors too, anyway. Hmm. Now, the swirling coiling thing that Sanaconda is doing is inspired by a few things. Firstly, it's how it shoots sand so hard. It's like a spring. You know those, like, ball launchers in pinball? Yeah, it works like that, but it's sand instead of a ball. The Pokedex even mentions this, quote, Its unique style of coiling allows it to blast sand out of its sand sack more efficiently. The Gigantamax form has similar inspirations. It's a coil to shoot sand out harder, but now it's also a tornado, or dust devil, causing a massive sandstorm always. And its signature move is G-Max Sand Blast, where it essentially acts as a sand blaster. Sand blasters are tools that mix fine sand with compressed air to basically rapidly sand things away, like rust off of metal. You need a lot of protection when using these tools, for obvious reasons, and so it works pretty well as a devastating G-Max attack. But clearly, if any Pokémon is going to be capable of such a feat, it's this one. But anyway, the coiling also comes from how various snakes like to sleep, or rest, while curled up all like this. It's cute. And then there's the not-so-cute act of constriction. Many species of snake use constriction to trap or hold their prey. It's what the Pokémon move Coil is doing. Some snakes that use constriction are also venomous, and they basically hold their prey still while the venom slowly kills them. That way the snake doesn't have to look for them later. And yes, anacondas are indeed constrictors. But most snakes that constrict only constrict. No venom. They kill their prey by literally grabbing and then squeezing the life out of them! But fun fact that I recently learned. The popular idea is that constriction suffocates the prey. You can't move your diaphragm, so you can't breathe if your diaphragm's squeezed that much, after all. But it turns out that this isn't the main factor at all. Rather, the squeezing is so tight and all over that not only do basically all of the bones break, but blood flow basically comes to a halt. The heart pumps but because of the pressure, the heart pumping not being able to relieve that pressure, the heart basically damages itself, so basically the prey dies via cardiac arrest long before it suffocates. Oh, fun. And, uh, <laughs> speaking of fun, fun is over. That was all nature and stuff, and the things that these Pokémon are for sure based on, rather than just merely me stretching the facts to teach a lesson in a video. Which is where we are now. That little disclaimer at the beginning of the video is now in effect. No more fun. Welcome to the sad zone. So snakes, long boys, they don't tend to move like how Sandaconda moves. Like, look at how Sandaconda moves. What in the world, it's so stupid and coiled up around itself. Now, while obviously this likely wasn't actually a part of Sandaconda's design inspiration, I am going to use this as an opportunity to talk about stuff that I think needs to be more well known. So, Sandaconda looks stuck. Like, it's wrapped around itself and trapped in this donut that is a part of itself. You ever wonder how snakes don't tie themselves into a knot accidentally? Well, basically, to not get super deep into it, it's because they have nerves and instincts, you know? Obviously, their brain has functions that prevent that from happening in the most part of cases. They know what they're doing, because they have a brain. But seeing that they have brains, clearly some snakes have brain problems, right? Some of them can have brain problems. Well, yeah, anything with a brain can have brain problems, clearly. Now, seemingly tangent time. Bear with me. You know how there are varying levels of controversial dog breeds like pugs? Early pugs are pretty cute, sure. But breeders and puppy mills continue, you know, breeding them, and they are becoming genetically worse and worse. I mean, don't even get me started on these toad bullies. I mean, most specialized breeds have some sort of health issue, but these issues are becoming more and more present as these breeders and mills are specializing them too much and inbreeding too much. We're getting dogs bred into an early grave because they can barely breathe, or 
dogs that are born into early joint pain and suffering because of skeletal problems. Skeletal structures are being more and more modified because people find it cute? Or in the case of these disgusting things, tough looking? Sometimes genetics can't even take it far enough, so ears and tails get clipped by the breeders, causing more harm than good. Their quality of life suffers, but at least it's only for a short while because their lifespans have been shrinking too. Many have organs that can't keep up, and so they die prematurely, but then they get marketed as just having a short lifespan naturally when really they are dying as young adults because they are genetic disasters. I'd say genetic mistakes, but no, it's done on purpose. And this isn't even going into the puppy mills having to put down many, many puppies because they are an unsellable genetic mush. Sure, sometimes the problems are cute and meme-worthy like that recent husky with silly eyes, but those are the few that they actually show. I mean, at the very least, most of these dogs are still capable of having happy, doggy lives despite them being bred having ever-increasing breathing or skeletal problems, you know? like. They, they're still having a blast being dogs. At least they aren't bred to have purposeful brain problems or something. Like some pet snakes. Many breeds and morphs of pet reptiles have issues too, just like dog breeds. But in many cases, it's much worse. There are proven methods to get entire sets of snake siblings with bone kinks, messing with organ function, and sometimes even being born without an anus. You'd think that if it's a known, guaranteed outcome, people would stop, but like with some of the puppy mills, even if you have to put down a few entire litters, it's worth it for you to get that one that isn't that bad, because you can sell it for big bucks. In the case of brain or neurological issues particularly, we're going to be looking at the spider ball python, a relatively recent breed of snake, and also one that is super easy comparatively to breed, and also because their pattern is pretty cool, they fly off of store shelves. For big bucks? Because the purchasers are usually just uneducated. You see, they fly off of the shelves not just figuratively, but literally too. Due to their genetics, they all have neurological issues. Yes, they are purposefully bred, despite all having what is essentially life-ruining brain damage. And the worst part is that people like them not only because of their cool markings, but some people like these snakes because they have personality. Yeah! Oh man. So these snakes can barely tell up from down, and as such, they fall and hurt themselves all the time. Basically always. They barely have a concept of which way they are going in relation to the rest of them, so they can get tied into knots or coil around themselves. More pain. And you can put a mouse in front of them and they'll slam into the side of the glass because they don't know how to move forward instead of to the side. This is all become known to be the spider wobble, and many breeders try to downplay it as, for sure, some spider ball pythons are worse than others. So the ones that only have it mildly, it's, it's a fun personality quirk. So you know, it's okay that they're breeding these and selling them. No, they're doing it for the money. They are very low cost and easy to breed, and they sell for a lot because they're fairly new and look pretty cool. But still, you breed a load of them, and a few of the ones in that load have the problem minimally. But I mean, you still, you still had to euthanize or scam people to get rid of the other dozen for every one good one you got, right? Imagine, imagine breeding a puppy blind on purpose because someone thinks it's cute how they run into stuff all the time. It's wrong. Like, the good here is that at least, at least it's a snake we're talking about, not something intelligent like a dog, but still. Now, you'd be happy to know that 
Various exotic pet shows are banning the sale of spiderball pythons at their expos, but most of them have always been sold online anyway. And I'm not here judging anyone that owns a spiderball python. Most of the ones that are sold are the few that managed to survive with only some neurological problems rather than the whole shebang and more than likely you bought it without knowing of these issues. But anyone purposefully breeding any sort of animal with known issues like this, they can get bent. Animal husbandry, like the, you're proof that animal husbandry really needs to be much more heavily regulated. Licenses need to be put in place that are much stricter because it's been proven now that self-policing doesn't work well enough. All in all, the lesson here is to always do a load of research before any animal purchase, please. Let Sandaconda remind you that there are snakes that are just as misshapen and mentally donked because of cruel humans. And also, for more information on this and all of the controversy around it, I recommend this video here. Seeing it is actually what made me want to make this video in the first place. Now, please be nice in the comments and... Never stop using your noggin.